In today's video, we have some significant updates on a potential Eric Carlson trade to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Plus, could we possibly see a blockbuster deal also involving San Jose with the Calgary Flames? There's been some rumors floating around about a two-for-two two trade that is apparently being discussed. We'll take a look at the possibilities of that. The Kraken have signed Vince Dunn to a new contract, fairly long-term and fairly lucrative as well. Uh, we also have some other news from around the league, including some arbitration case news as well. All that comes Coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of initial news and some trade rumors to take a look at today. Big update on Eric Carlson. We'll get to that here in just a few moments' time. First up, though, I want to talk about the big news that just broke a few moments ago when that Seattle Kraken announcing they've come to terms with restricted free agent defenseman Vince Dunn. Uh, they did have an arbitration case scheduled here in the next few days, and they avoid arbitration and get this deal on the books on their own getting a four-year contract at $7.35 million. This is a pretty fair deal, I think. A uh, good compromise for both sides. Obviously, Vince Dunn has always been an offensively gifted defenseman, good skater, um, but really broke out this past year and exceeded 60 points for the first time in his career. Uh, he's 26 years old, so this will take him to age 30. I think based on being a 60-point offensive defenseman, a lot of those guys are getting up around $8 million. I, I think that... That's a, a bit of a savings here for Seattle in a sense. Now, of course, uh, they could have gone longer term and they would have been able to command around eight or more, I think, on a seven or eight year contract. Clearly, this works better for both sides on a short term basis. It allows Vince Dunn to get paid rather handsomely compared to what he was making before. He was making four million bucks. This is a big jump to 735 and it allows him to be a free agent again that is still at a good age at age 30 when the salary cap will be significantly higher. So allow him a chance to get a, one more longer term contract and still cash in again. I mean, this at the same time allows Seattle uh, a little bit of protection. I mean, as much as you want to think that Vince Dunn's only going to continue to get better and be consistent, it's the first time he's also put up 60 points as well. So, you know, it gives them a little bit of protection. It's not too long in case that doesn't happen. So uh, I think, like I said, based on where he was at last year, I, I'm not, I'm a little surprised it's not closer to, to eight, um, but this is a pretty good deal for both sides. And I think he'll be a great fit there on a longer term basis. So Vince Dunn and the Kraken avoid arbitration. Uh, some other arbitration news, the, uh, Obviously, a hearing took place yesterday between the Chicago Blackhawks and Philip Kurashev. So I believe we should have the results on that in the award announced sometime tomorrow. Uh, and the Toronto Maple Leafs and goaltender Ilya Samsonov did also move forward with their arbitration case today. Uh, so they did not come to terms before the hearing starts. Now, in these cases as well, uh, as a couple of years ago, the rules changed in the latest CBA update that once the hearing starts, Starts, they can't come to terms and settle on their own once it starts they have to go through with it uh, whereas before that they could continue to negotiate and if they came to their own contract agreement before the arbitrator made their announcement then that's what was they could do that and that would that would, that would stick so not anymore um so sam sonoff and the leafs go through the process i know i've seen people talking about how surprised they were and obviously the leafs are up uh, against it pretty tight i've seen former players including a former leaf player and jeff o'neill uh talk about how he you know he went through this himself and he just said he he really hates to see anybody go through this because he remembers leaving his arbitration case going I don't want to play for this team anymore. Ultimately, like as you get to hear from the team that you're uh, employed with or about to be employed with again, likely that you know they don't value you as much as you think you value yourself. And of course, they're trying to focus on all your negatives or things you need to work on. It's like I said, it's like a court case. It's it's not fun, um, and it often does do damage to the player team relationship. So hopefully that's not the case here. But um, like I said before, it, oftentimes. That does happen. Now, when the player elects arbitration, usually the team has an option to go one or two years on whatever the award is. Uh, however, in Samsonov's case, he's one year away from being an unrestricted free agent, so it has to be a one-year deal. Uh, obviously, in those cases, they can't um, get contracts that take them past their unrestricted free agent 
year. So that's where things are at as far as the arbitration goes. So on Saturday, we should find out on Kurashev. And Sunday, we will uh, likely get an announcement sometime in the afternoon on whatever's been awarded for Samsonov. And then from there, of course, we know the Leafs are likely going to have to make a move unless they can confirm that Matt Murray's not going to play this year. Um, otherwise, I'd expect a buyout to come shortly after, possibly a trade with a sweetener. We'll have to wait and see how the Leafs handle things there. Uh, after that, arbitration cases are going to be a little bit quiet because a lot of the other cases that were scheduled have been settled on their own. Uh, the next one that's scheduled that's not yet settled is a couple on July 30th, which is Jeremy Swayman in Boston and Jack McBain in Arizona. So uh, they could come to terms ahead of time, but if not, those are the next possible names that you'll hear going forth with their cases. So that's still over nine days away. Um, the other thing we learned today as well in the news was that Panthers prospect Alexi Heponiemi, who's been playing in North America with the in the Panther system uh, for four years, uh, mostly all in the minors with very limited NHL exposure, has decided to head back and play in Europe. So uh, I think, I don't know, I can't say he's given up on his NHL dream, but he's certainly... Uh, you know, at least putting it on hold and not seeing an opportunity there after putting in a lot of time developing through the minor league system. So we'll see if he returns or not. The Panthers will still hold his rights should he try again at the NHL down the road. Now, as I mentioned, we have a couple of different things I want to take a look at on the trade front. Uh, one, we have a big update when it comes to the uh, Eric Carlson trade scenario going to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now, we know that the Hurricanes are still in the mix, but as I've said before, I really don't see that happening myself. I think Pittsburgh is a much better fit. Carlson has a lot of say here, and I think it just overall um, will be something he would much prefer to do. But that's just my opinion. Uh, also, stylistically, I think it's a better fit as well. Uh, but here's a big update from uh, Penn's writer Rob Rossi in The Athletic with a lot of uh, updates here on this scenario. So uh, a couple of things we've talked about. We've talked about the fact that the Penguins are going to have to shed money. We already know that. Uh, Jeff Petrie, Mikhail Granlin are the prime candidates. They might have to shed one. It's possible they may have to shed both. A lot of this is going to be determined as well by uh, the amount that the Sharks are willing to retain on the Carlson contract. But of course, the more they retain the more they're going to want. Uh, so the, really, in a sense, like you get, they need to balance that out. You don't want to overpay too much, So, you, but at the same time, you want to cap it as low as you can get it. So you got to find that balance, which is going to be tricky. Now, apparently Kyle Dubas had already met with Jeff Petrie uh, earlier in the offseason after taking over the job in Pittsburgh. And obviously Petrie's a, a Michigan player, um, resides there in the summer, and uh, he apparently went to, uh, to, to speak to him about his future in Pittsburgh. And it sounds like, based on what the reporters know, that Jeff Petrie, who does have a modified no trade clause and can block a trade, I think it's about 15 teams, does not want to head as far west as California. That's you know he's got a young family, wants to be as close to home as possible. When he was traded for Montreal, I uh, didn't mind going to Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh was okay for him, but last year obviously wasn't the greatest. It hasn't really worked out, and now Dubas and the Penguins are considering trying to find a way to move on from him and get him a fresh start somewhere else uh, to finish out that contract. Now, obviously, the Sharks uh, may or may not want Petrie anyway, but no matter how they feel about taking on a bad contract, uh, Jeff Petrie has no desire to go to the San Jose Sharks. So we've been hearing a lot about a third team being necessary, required, and this is likely why. Now, we talked before that um, the Penguins could buy out either Petrie or Granlin, and then the other could be included to the Sharks trade. But uh, depending on how they want to go about this and what San Jose will take, that may not be possible. Now, as I mentioned before, if you take a look at um, the buyout possibilities, and the Penguins will get a second window. They have an arbitration case scheduled with Drew O'Connor, which is one of the last ones in early August. Now, once that contract's settled, uh, they will have a second buyout window. So they likely will exercise a buyout on one of these players, I would think, regardless of the Carlson trade uh, going down or not. Now, when it comes to uh, Petrie and Granlin, Granlin does give them more savings on the cap by doing that as a buyout as opposed to Petrie. So to me, that makes more sense. But at the same time, like I said, the tricky part here is Granlin has no trade protection in his contract. So including him 
is as simple as getting the sharks to agree to it. You don't need any special permission or anything waived, whereas Petrie, you would. We know Petrie does not want to go to San Jose. So if they can't find a third team to take on Petrie, that's going to be problematic. Now, they also might want a third team to retain a little bit on uh, Carlson's contract. So it's possible you could see Eric Carlson traded from San Jose to a third team, and then you might see that same third team or a different or even a fourth team take on the Jeff Petrie contract as well. And then, of course, they're going to have to be paid something to uh, to do that. And then, of course, this other team could retain a little extra on Carlson as well. So it's it's kind of difficult and complicated to see how it could go down. But a lot there's a lot of moving parts here, and it just really boils down to how it's all going to work. And this is why it's taking so long as well. Now, apparently, uh, Dubas has talked with the leadership on the player side in Pittsburgh, Crosby, Malkin, Latang, and they are very much all in favor and on board of Carlson coming to Pittsburgh should he be able to pull off the trade. Sounds like Latang is willing to let Carlson be the power play quarterback and maybe play a, a different role on power play too. And of course, they can still both play you know good minutes on five on five. Now, so that that's good that all those players are very much on par. Now, the Sharks apparently are very interested in defenseman Marcus Pedersen. So far, Kyle Dubas has been reluctant to include him in a trade offer, but that is the roster player that they seem most intrigued by especially on the back end so that's something that Dubas has not really wanted to do so far but might have to to get it done any first round pick that the Penguins are willing to include Dubas wants to make sure his draft lottery protected for a top five pick um, that's probably you know they could go further and ask for top 10 but you know that's that's might be pushing their luck here the Sharks to agree would probably agree to a top five and then it could be deferred um, now, of course, there could be other picks besides a first rounder, and those other picks might have conditions on them. At least what the Dubas and the Penguins would like to do is that they might have like conditional picks that say if they win a certain number of playoff series or if they win the Stanley Cup or something like that, then the pick can be upgraded. Uh, otherwise, it'll you know be a later round or, or whatever. So uh, there's going to be some conditions on stuff like that. And, of course, like I said before, a lot of this depends on the amount of money that San Jose is willing to retain. And San Jose is not going to you know do this for nothing. The more they retain – the more they're going to expect Pittsburgh to pay up and the uh, offer price to go back the other way. So clearly, it, you know, maybe it's a case of Marcus Pedersen being the main roster player going to the Sharks along with, uh, you know, picks and prospects. And that might be a combination of what they get. What that exact package could be, difficult to say. I mean, obviously the Penguins are not exactly, you know, loaded with picks, but there could be, um, or prospects, I mean, but like, there could be a few of those in there and it could be something along those lines. But like I said, the third team would make more sense. If they if they buy out Granlin, they get the maximum savings on a buyout. And if they can move Petrie to a third team um, that's com- that's agreeable to him, then that would be more likely. Now, of course, I'm sure Petrie would love to go to a team like Detroit. I don't really see that happening. Uh, that would be like a hometown uh, reunion for him um, but with all the moves that Iserman has made I don't really see that being likely or possible maybe a team like Chicago might work that might be an option for them they obviously have lots of cap space as well uh, that might be a possibility I'm not sure but um, essentially that's where things are at with with the Penguins and with Carlson so I think in all likelihood um, it's quite likely that Pittsburgh can pull it off I think it's just going to take some time, and it could very well push into August, maybe the, you know beyond the arbitration case for Joe O'Connor. Once they do that, they do a buyout of, say, Granlin. It's going to take them a little bit to figure out a, a trade of Petrie. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked, to be honest with you, if they trade Petrie and try to figure that out regardless of Carlson coming or not. That would not be a shocker. Um, and then, like I said, of course, uh, you know the other part of it will all be mainly future um, you know, pick some prospects. So lots of uh, lots of updates there from Rob Rossi. Uh, I can see how this could work, and I can see how this could take some time as well, which is why it's dragging on so long. And the other rumor that's been floating around here as well is, speaking of the Sharks and Carlson, could we see a blockbuster deal between San Jose and Calgary and see some even more significant change in the Sharks lineup? So I keep seeing this rumor that there's apparently a trade being discussed. And I, I don't know. I haven't seen this rumor from enough 
reliable sources to say that it's more of a thing, but it seems to be making its rounds to so many different places. I have to wonder if there's something to it, but at the same time, I personally don't think this is going to happen. I'll warn you of that, but it just, it's gone. I've seen it in so many places online, so many different articles and places discussing this option that I just wanted to get my opinion out there on it and discuss it quickly. So the trade rumor is as follows that the flames would trade Elias Lindholm and Danny Vladar to the San Jose Sharks for Captain Logan Couture and William Eklund. Now that to me would be a steal for San Jose in a sense that Couture comes with term. Yes, he's older than Lindholm and it's hard to say if he can be as productive in the next few years. I'm going to argue maybe not, but at least he's coming with enough term on his contract that you know he's going to be there and play and be a top six for you for a few years. William Eklund is a heck of a prospect. I don't understand why San Jose would trade Eklund. That that part to me doesn't make any sense. Now, would they be interested in Lindholm? Sure, if he signed an extension, and I can see why they'd want to move on from Couture's contract, and it really allows another older veteran player to move on and to shed some salary. So, yeah, I from San Jose's perspective, I do get that. Uh, from Calgary's perspective, they said they get a you know a veteran player with term. Um, not ideal. I think they'd rather have somebody a little younger, where it's Lindholm that's going out. Vladar, we know, is in a bit of a crowded crease scenario, so I get that. He can maybe get a bigger role in San Jose. Um, I don't know. They obviously have a few goalies there already too, so that's complicated. But I just don't know that this deal makes perfect sense. Now, we know Lindholm has so far has refused to sign a contract extension. The Flames and new GM Craig Conroy have backed up the Brinks truck and reportedly offered this guy an eight-year contract extension somewhere around 8 to $9 million. We don't know the exact figures, but that's the rumored extension that's been on the table. And he's been obviously non-committal wanting to sign that. And he hasn't really said for sure that he won't or that he's leaving. But at the same time, when that's been there, considering what he's, you know, but if you look at his stats and what it would be a reasonable offer for him, uh, you know, if he's not signing that, to me that says he's, he doesn't want to be there, uh, or at least not on a very long-term basis. Vladar, we know he's likely going to get moved because of the crowded crease making room for Dustin Wolf. That makes a lot of sense as well. And I can't, the Flames, I'm sure, would love to get William Eklund. Uh, and if they have to take on Logan Couture to get Eklund, I'm sure they would do that. I, I just, to me, this doesn't make any sense for San Jose in that in that sense. I mean, for the San Jose Sharks to move Couture, get the the younger Lindholm for a year, even if he doesn't stay, it still makes sense. Um, Vladar makes sense for them for the future, but why in the world would the San Jose Sharks want to part ways? with William Eklund, and why would they feel like they needed to add him to a deal to move on from a contract like Logan Couture? Uh, that, to me, was just what they would set the San Jose Sharks back. I mean, give them some good flexibility with the money of Couture's contract being off the books. Maybe Lindholm only goes for a year, doesn't stay. Even if he does re-sign, they get a younger centerman to replace Couture. Okay, I, I get that. Comparable money, but I don't know. Uh, Eklund would be a, a disaster to, to trade him. Uh, he didn't play a lot last year. He had limited action, but he had a really solid American Hockey League season. He's only 20 years old, a really high pick from just a couple of years ago. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, would Logan Couture for Lindholm one for one be a deal? Probably not. I think with Lindholm being uh, younger, and with Couture having more money on this deal, I think the Sharks would have to include something else uh, to make the Flames want to take that on uh, it's straight up for Lindholm. So I don't think it'd be one for one. I can see Vladar going to the Sharks or a different team as well. I just don't think it's going to be Eklund that's going with Couture. You know, would they maybe include Bordalo or a different prospect that's maybe not as high end? Maybe that's a possibility. Another one that's you know uh, has potential but not. Um, as elite level, at least projection wise, as Eklund could be. So, anyway, that I find that trade very in interesting. I find it very unlikely, at least in the current state. I, I would not be shocked if Couture and Lindholm were both dealt. Wouldn't be shocked if they were traded in a deal for each other. 
Um, I don't know if Logan Couture has any desire to go to Calgary because he does have a lot of protection in his contract for trades as well. Uh, there's a very limited number of teams that he could go to without being uh, consented on. So I don't know if that's uh, something he wants to do or not. So we'll have to wait and see. But let me know your thoughts on this rumored uh, blockbuster deal that's been um, highly discussed on a lot of different websites, a lot of different news sites as well. Um, do you think there's anything to this? Does this deal make sense for both sides? Is it logical? It could happen. Let me know your thoughts as well as the Carlson news and everything else discussed today as well. Down in the comments, we'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Oh,